Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where Marvel Studios continues to play the long game. Now, I don't know if this is Marvel Studios' own doing or if it's just the uh, entertainment media getting out ahead of Marvel uh, to meet demand for information about upcoming Marvel movies, but if it's the latter, Marvel really needs to get a grip on this because I think that the focus on films that are years in the future is hurting the films that are coming out today. Uh, for instance, that was a theory some people had about Avengers Age of Ultron, that people were already focusing uh, so much on Civil War that Avengers Age of Ultron almost seemed like old news when it hit theaters. And that seems to already be happening to Captain America Civil War which is, like, still filming. So what am I talking about? Well, there were a lot of headlines yesterday about a potential second villain for Avengers Infinity War because of some kind of casting announcement that went out. Uh, now, it's really premature to be casting Avengers uh, Infinity War, but maybe they need to, like, uh, sow the seeds for this character in advance. Who knows? Uh, and they might because I suspect that the beginnings of this character will have to happen in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, uh, which of course hits theaters before Avengers Infinity War. So what am I talking about? Well, the casting uh, releases or announcements for Avengers Infinity War have specifically mentioned uh, Mag Magus or Magus. That's the problem with comic books. You don't hear these names out loud, so you never quite know how to pronounce them. But who is that? Well, that is indeed one of the main villains, actually the main villain of Infinity War, Avengers Infinity War. It's Thanos and Magus, Magus. Uh, and I'm trying to read Infinity War, by the way, because I wanted to report on it. But I'm have a, having a heck of a time getting through that thing. It is super convoluted, even from like a comic book fan's perspective, like a comic book reader's perspective. I mean, we're used to convoluted storylines, but even with this, I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. This takes too long and there are too many characters. I mean, I make these videos, you know, crowded as f uh, Like, this is just like crowded as f It's like ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, uh, Magus is the evil side, like the evil version of Adam Warlock, right? It's like if you took all of Adam Warlock's horrible qualities and meanness and uh, every bad aspect of his personality and separated it from his body, you would have Magus. So Adam Warlock was teased in the first Guardians of the Galaxy. His cocoon uh, was in the collector's collection. So it does make sense potentially that he'll be introduced there, but I think that that is problematic for Guardians of the Galaxy too, because you know they're supposed to introduce Star-Lord's father, unless it's going to be like Adam Warlock maybe, which would be a major change from continuity, but they did say that I believe they weren't going with the Spartax Empire, so it could be Adam Warlock. Uh, but I, as I've said before, I think it would be smarter to just have Star-Lord Star fill in for Adam Warlock and take over that role in this storyline. Because uh, Guardians of the Galaxy isn't even just Star-Lord's story, it's the whole team's story, right? And they desperately need, in my opinion, to spend more time developing those characters. Uh, most people really enjoyed that first movie, uh, but I think that it would be a little bit of a disservice to those fans for the second film to have those characters all become secondary to this Adam Warlock character, right? But he has to be introduced somewhere because if you don't have him, you can't have Magus. And I don't know where else he could possibly be introduced but Guardians of the Galaxy, where he is first introduced in the comics. And that's why, uh, and it's his relationship with the Guardians of the Galaxy that introduced, I believe he's actually with the Guardians of the Galaxy at the beginning of the Infinity comic, the Infinity War comic. And so, uh, but there's no Peter Quill. It's, you know, him running with the rest of the crew. So that's why I was like, well, you know, I'll have Star-Lord take over that part because Star-Lord's not here in the comic. Uh, but maybe Chris Pratt will be so busy with other offers that he's like, go ahead, let Adam Warlock step in there. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm very curious to see how this works out. But I think that for people to be talking about Infinity War now uh, is just another, like, one of Marvel's, I think, few problems, right? But it could be, like, a really big one. It could be, like, an Achilles heel. So I'm curious, what do you think of this news? First, so from a different angles. First of all, what do you think of people talking about Infinity War already? What do you think of uh, Adam Warlock potentially being introduced in Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think that they can really handle uh, developing and introducing a whole new character? I mean, do you feel they paid enough attention to the actual Guardians of the Galaxy crew in the first film? And also, what do you think is going to happen to Peter Quill if Adam Warlock is there, right? I mean, can you have both characters? And then also, have, have any of you read Infinity War? I mean, I, I know there are some fans of the Infinity War comic, uh, but I mean, do you think it will translate well to film? And, you know, people talked about Avengers Age of Ultron being overly complicated for mainstream viewers who don't read comics. I mean, if that was tough, 
imagine f trying to follow Infinity War. Although the Russo brothers might be better suited for that, uh, we'll see. But if they have, I think if you have to do Infinity War, you can't be sowing seeds for any other movies. I mean, there's just like so many different threads there. I don't know how they could possibly, you know, trying to service other films in addition. So I think that this might be, you know, Marvel could have bitten off more than they could chew here. Uh, and I also feel that the publicity situation for them is developing into a bit of a problem. You know, the downside of planning your movies publicly so far in advance, right? All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the second story of the day is a pretty big one that broke last night, and that's that uh, J.K. Rowling has written a play for Harry Potter. Now, a lot of people expected this to happen, but the play itself sounds very interesting. It's called Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, and it's hashtag Cursed Child, uh, which is, of course, not only uh, a really good title in terms of Harry Potter lore, but, I mean, it just is very high concept, right? You're like, cursed child, I'm the hair. Now, even though the theatrical website has said that this is going to, uh, quote unquote, explore the backstory leading up to Harry's parents and timely death at the hands of Lord Voldemort, J.K. Rowling has said it is not a prequel. So my guess is maybe excitedly, I think this is a great idea, that it could focus on Harry Potter as an adult uh, and he's exploring some other cursed child, and maybe it ties into his own backstory, right? But I think the idea of fast-forwarding with Harry Potter to his adult years is a very smart idea. It opens the door for Daniel Radcliffe to return for a movie if they wanted to do that. And it also opens the door for someone else to be cast in the role. Uh, you know, perhaps whoever maybe wants to handle it in the theatrical version. I just think it's a really smart idea, and I wouldn't lose Harry. Uh, I think that, you know, they are establishing the Wizarding World, as we discussed before. Uh, they're going to rebrand the whole franchise as J.K. Rowling's Wiz Wizarding World, which I think is very smart. But Harry Potter could still be a major character there. And I think that as the audience grows up, you know, the fan base, it's very smart to grow up with them. This is something the Legend, Co Legend of Korra did brilliantly, uh, building off of the Avatar, the original Last Airbender audience. So I think for Harry Potter to do the same, that as that fan base becomes, you know, older, have Harry Potter also get older, I think is very, very smart. And I think would allow Warner Brothers to effectively return to that franchise in addition to exploring um, the Newt Scamander storyline. So I think it's great, and I hope that's what it is. But I think the tickets go on sale in the fall, and I think they're going to sell out like crazy. And I hope it comes uh, uh, here to New York. That would be wonderful as well. But, you know, J.K. Rowling is so uh, Brit-centric and wanting to promote the UK, which I think is wonderful, that I wouldn't be surprised if she only kept it in the UK and said, hey, if you're a Harry Potter fan and you want to see this, come to England. All right, so that's the second story of the day. So I'm curious, do you think this sounds like a good idea? Uh, do you like that it could be an adult? Do you want to see an adult Harry Potter or do you want to leave Harry Potter uh, in at Hogwarts and, you know, that little epilogue for you is enough? All right, so the third story of the day is that uh, the, um, the non-core non Disney properties, uh, in particular, we're talking about Marvel and uh, Star Wars, are beginning to show up more and more in the theme parks, particularly Disneyland, because, you know, in Orlando, Disney World, they can't have any Marvel characters because of a contract with Universal Studios at Islands of Adventure, right? But they can do it in Disneyland. Uh, so uh, you're seeing, you know, merchandise being sold there, very popular character meet and greets, but then some other really fun things in particular I wanted to discuss today. The big headline, of course, is that Paul Rudd showed up at Disneyland to surprise fans. And I love that in this photo, some little kids have Ant-Man costumes on right? I'm like, how many of those are like Disney employee children, right? Specifically from the publicity department was like, we need some kids here in Ant-Man costumes. Because I'm like, that movie hasn't even come out yet. I think you'd be hard pressed to find some kids who are like, yeah, Ant-Man. But anyway, I thought that was great that Paul Rudd showed up. It would have been even cooler if he showed up in costume. Uh, but you know, there, you know, you can't, no matter what happens with Ant-Man, you can't say that Paul Rudd hasn't worked really hard to promote the film. So kudos to him. And I don't blame him because he really needs this to work because his box office numbers have been really depressed uh, in anything that's any other film recently, actually, with the exception, I think, of Anchorman 2. But overall, Paul Rudd is not a box office draw. So he needs to prove that when a Marvel movie, he doesn't at least hold it back. So kudos for him for going out there. And I think it makes for a great photo op. But then what really, really uh, made me excited from a fan point of view are these Death Star balloons. I think they're so awesome. Like, who wouldn't want to walk around with a floating Death Star above them? And then 
take it out at the end of the day, right? You're like, this has to go. Uh, so I just think it's an awesome idea and it's a really well-realized balloon. Uh, and it's just funny to see those elements in the Disney parks. I'm a big Disney fan, big Disney theme park fan. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure how I would feel seeing these other brands in the parks, you know, particularly because I don't like seeing outside consumer brands there. Like, I don't like when they bring McDonald's or Starbucks. I'm like, you know, those exist in the real world. Disney World's supposed to be its own little bubble in Disneyland. But I think so far, uh, the Star Wars and Marvel stuff is working. And anything that makes the parks even more popular. But uh, I hope that Disney uh, maintains the same level of quality and tone that they've always kept and doesn't, just, just doesn't go, you know, Marvel and Star Wars crazy to make a buck. But uh, it's, it's nice to see it, and it's nice to see uh, those beloved properties getting so much attention, right? I mean, it's nice to be part of the Disney empire. You get a, you get a balloon. That's pretty cool. By the way, I also think that balloon on the left is pretty nice as well. All right, so on to the viewer question, which comes from uh, Shailen uh, Fritzler. And Shailen says, Grace, I have a question about the reboot, the re-reboot of Spider-Man between Sony and Marvel. Uh, what are they going to do when it comes to a female lead romantic interest? Are they going to go with Mary Jane Watson again? Are they going to do Gwen, uh, even though, and go against, to, uh, are they going to do Gwen to go with the continuity? Uh, even though we all know that she dies, um, I guess you know, well, it's a reboot. It's a re-reboot, so they're not going to pick up where the other films left off. Although you know, of course, Gwen Stacy died. It's very, it's a big as as uh, Shailen is uh, referring to. It's a big mess. So anyway, she says, um, could they go with someone new? I personally think it'd be interesting to do someone new, but not introduce them in the first film, at least romantically. I feel that would be just too much like the first two series to have Peter going through Spider-Man changes and handle girls. Girls can be quite a handful. Smiley face. Thanks, and I'd love it if you answered my question. Happy to answer your question. Great, uh, great, great question, Shaylin. I think that they definitely shouldn't have a romantic interest in this uh, new film. Why? Well, I don't know how they're going to get around it because they're going back to high school, right? And Mary Jane and Gwen Stacy are a big part of Peter Parker's high school experience. But I think there was just so much attention paid to Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane Watson and so much attention paid to, uh, you know, um, Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy, almost to the point that she took over the second, you know, the reboot. Uh, that I would not go there again. I think it's getting a little ridiculous to recast these characters again and again and again. I think they're starting to lose their specialness in uh, media outside of comics, right? I think it's like it's like almost becoming like a, a theme park stage show. Like, who cares who plays Peter Parker? Who cares who plays Mary Jane? Like, they're, they're not establishing these characters and making a strong connection with the audience. Uh, I think the only one who really did was Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy, and that really, I think, derailed the Amazing Spider-Man films, because they became a romantic film first and, like, a comic book movie second. It really was about the Peter Parker-Gwen Stacy relationship, and I think that Emma Stone was so strong in the role, and I think because she was so strong, the filmmakers... Um, gravitated towards that. They weren't disciplined enough to be like, we need to limit this before it takes over the film. They just ran with it. They're like, this is so great. Let's just focus on it. And you're like, but these aren't the Gwen Stacy movies. I mean, they were so Gwen Stacy centric that it brought about the creation of Spider Gwen, where Gwen just becomes Spider Man, right? They're like, let's just cut out the middleman, Peter Parker, and just get right to the heart of the matter. And, you know, I think there's been a very favorable reaction to Spider Gwen to the point where there's even like some discussion that maybe Emma Stone would come back and play that role. But I would like to see someone new. I think that they need to break the cycle somehow, and I think people are just really... I'm getting tired. I don't know if I can sit through more Peter Parker stories. You know, I just think it's... Especially because they're not... They don't feel new because they keep going back in time, right? I think it's just too much. Not enough of a breather between these reboots. But I would like to see someone new. Silk is a new recent character. She's like a female version of Spider-Man. Uh, she's Asian-American, which is also, uh, I think, a good way to go. And there's a romantic vibe between the two of them because they both have their spider hormones. So, like, uh, they want to, you know, quote-unquote mate. I don't think you could explore that too much in high school, but maybe you could because hormones are out of control anyway. But, you know, it's a different character. She has superpowers, and it would just shake things up a little bit. But I'm curious to how you guys feel. Uh, I know a lot of you are eager to see Peter Parker revisited again with the hopes that maybe the third time will be the charm and they'll finally get it just right. But what do you think about bringing back Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy? And what do you think of the idea of, you know, again, making Peter Parker's life so much about his romantic entanglements? I mean, I know those have been a very big part of Spider-Man lore, but I think they've overshadowed the other great aspects of Spider-Man lore. Some of the great stories with him and his villains. I think his villain, you know, usually it's the villains are the ones who might steal the show. But I think with the Spider-Man movies, it's the love interests that steal the show. And 
you know, you have to be disciplined. While it's great, you know, while I love, of course, strong female characters, it's not their movies. So thank you so much for your question, uh, Shaylin. I hope you liked my answer. Everybody, please uh, chime in down below in the comments and also comment on the three stories of the day and let me know anything you'd like to see covered on Monday and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.